Thank you so much for giving me a chance to come and talk to you. It's really a privilege to be here. Um, just briefly, I'll, I'll, um, I'll spend a little time talking about myself, my background, uh, how I ended up in the position that I've ended, ended up. And uh, just as a way of full disclosure, I've been in my current position for about five weeks now, so very new. So I'll share with you my perspective after five weeks on the job and, and what I hope to, what, what my hopes are in terms of what I hope to accomplish in this position um, at CTSI. I think it's a time of huge opportunity, so I hope to um, engage all of you and because and, 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 I consider the folks in this room to be a great, valuable resource community resource in helping me achieve what, what I hope to achieve in, in this position as well. So I hope to have a chance to partner with many of you in this room as well. Um, so um, my title is uh, Director of Early Translational Research for CTSI, and many already did a terrific job of describing um, CTI, CTSI as an organization and, and our overall goal. Um, I also have a faculty appointment in the pulmonary and critical care division and uh, uh, in the Department of Medicine. Um, joined CTSI on April 26th. Uh, and before, before CTSI, I was at Genentech for seven years. Um, and my most recent role at Genentech was uh, as the therapeutic area head in early clinical development for infectious diseases, cardiovascular, metabolism, and respiratory. Uh, before that, I was at UCSF for nine years as a clinical fellow, uh, a research fellow, and, um, and also as faculty uh, for, for, uh, for a good duration of time. Um, so just quickly, I, I you know, did my internship in residency at Harbor UCLA uh, in internal medicine, did my pulmonary fellowship here at UCSF, did a research fellowship thereafter for, uh, at UCSF as well, and was on faculty here for four years, and, um, and was a director of high-risk asthma clinic at San Francisco General Hospital, was um, at the time, and I can tell you about some, some of the, um, uh, some of the uh, thinking that went into my transition into industry as well. So um, very basic sort of research I was doing at UCSF, and and had a, had a real desire to actually do something that was more translational in, recent, tra translational in nature. And um, looked around within UCSF and interviewed, lot, interviewed and talked with a lot, a lot of different folks to figure out ways in which I can parlay what I was doing into a translational type of research. And um, realized that really some of the, some of the infrastructural support um, that would allow me to become productive in a, in a um, relative short time frame was uh, not, not fair or at, at that time. And so actually just uh, um, came across a job posting um, at Genentech which described a job that sounded right up my alley and, and submitted my resume and got a call the next day and that was the extent of my job search. And actually had a terrific, terrific time at Genentech. I initially joined Genentech to work on um, uh, a molecule. So my research was uh, focused on airway biology and, and cytokines related to asthma and other lung diseases like lung fibrosis. Went to Genentech and worked on um, a molecule that had just gotten approved for treatment of asthma, which many of you may know about, Zolair. Initially worked on phase 3B and and, and uh, phase four programs and then moved over to early clinical development because really, um, you know, phase three B and, and phase four things were interesting to me, but I really wanted to be at that place where science intersects with, with uh, clinics, the, the translational space. And so I moved over to early clinical development, initially worked on respiratory programs, was able to broaden to include uh, rheumatology and immunology programs. and. And as I indicated earlier, more recently, um, in the last several years, was able to take on uh, leadership opportunities in infectious diseases, cardiovascular metabolism, and 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 uh, respiratory. And I think in that process, um, got uh, you know really it was a terrific opportunity to really learn um, 
the basic principles of drug development and and I have to say there are lots of people lots of companies that that have many different models for how to address that translational space some successful some less successful and I think we've been hearing a lot about um, all the non-success that's out there in the industry but I think you know uh, uh, to the extent that um, that success is measured by good molecules in the pipeline. I think uh, Genentech would be uh, considered one of the more successful companies. Certainly could do better as well. But so, so with that, um, you know, I, uh, I was uh, tapped to consider this position here in CTSI and, and, um, Actually, the title uh, we decided on after I decided to accept the position, and the job description we've not yet written, and I will be, <laughs> I am also tasked to write the job description as I figure out how, how we should prioritize the, the, the work that CTSI does uh, uh, in terms of uh, facilitating the work that the translational researchers in this community is trying to do. But a very high level, high level charge is to really enhance and facilitate early research efforts here by facilitating collaborative translational efforts within UCSF, so within the community here at UCSF, but also to facilitate UCSF industry collaborative efforts and then to contribute to the uh, early translational research related educational efforts as well. Um, and this is, you know, I think uh, many mentioned it just a little bit earlier, and many of you have may have seen this this article in Nature uh, from 2008. And I'll just, you know, I think you can just uh, you can uh, um, substitute NIH there for UCSF, and I think it, you know, it sort of conveys some of the challenges that. Uh, we've been facing, and I'll just read that quickly. There's no question that the NIH or UCSF excels in basic research. What researchers are asking is whether it has neglect neglected the mandate to apply that knowledge outside the uh, UCSF. Too, there is a growing perception that the enormous resources being put into biomedical research and the huge strides made in understanding disease mechanisms are not resulting in commensurate gains in new treatments, diagnostics, and prevention. And this is uh, you know, this is a sentiment and a belief that many from all sides, not just academia, uh, uh, is uh, expressing, but also on the industry side as well. And, and I think industry faces slight, you know, that that challenge from a slightly different angle. But you know, I, industry also recognizes that sort of a closed container approach is not working very well and that there's a there's obviously a need to uh, connect to the amazing discovery science that's going on in the academic world that sometimes gets shelved. The shelves are way too full of things that ought to be uh, getting out there and certainly I think everyone also recognizes that not all research that gets done at a university is meant to be um, one that gets turned into therapeutics. Many, many things that get done are, are um, to really primarily broaden the knowledge base, and that's our UCSF's core strength. So that should not, um, you know, that should not be jeopardized at the cost of trying to find the right molecules. But on the other hand, there are huge opportunities in, in res with respect to discovery science that has the potential to impact health that's not being capitalized on at the moment. So I think, you know, we're at this really interesting place where, where um, you know, on both sides of the fence, academia and, and industry, if you consider that the fence divides those two, those two entities, there's, uh, you know, people have turned around to look at each other to find ways in which we can make things work better. So, um, you know, people people have asked me, well, why why did you take the job? Because I actually really loved my job at Genentech. I had a really great job, and I think um, why now? I think those two factors that that really the world around us is changing around how industry and and um, academia uh, looks to work together, 
and how academicians look to work better together with each other by way of you know, a lot of the things that many had already mentioned. And I think um, you know, UCSF, the, the leadership by way of Sue Hellman and, 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 um, and Jeff Bluestone, the executive vice chancellor, they, there's a real will to actually make it happen and, and do it well and do it right here. So, you know, looking at the institution, the Institute of UCSF, uh, I think there's, if ever this is going to happen, the, this valley of death is, is to be bridged. I think this is, all of the right elements are lined up to make it happen. And if I can, it would be a privilege for me to take part in that, uh, that endeavor. And external to UCSF, we talked about the industry and funding agencies, all of the changing and philosophy as well as perspective and, and, um, and, and, and the work that's followed suit. So translational research in drug development. So in thinking about, well, you know, how does drug development happen? You have discovery. Um, and that's what, that's a huge core strength of UCSF. We do that really, really well. And then there's early stage research, there's late stage research, and then, and then you, and then you go to early development uh, before you file IND, right? And then you go to early clinical development. And I'll talk about um, at each of those stages a little bit more. But really, um, when you're in discovery is when you really start thinking about, well, why are we doing this? What's the met need? Um, and you know what's the need potential for this clinical indication. Some of that sort of scaffolding, uh, the, the work, some of the scaffolding to, to have those conversations, I think, sometimes don't happen in the academic arena. Um, and then, you know, and, and then with respect to a lot of the um, uh, scaffolding that's required to get through the early stage, late stage, and IND enabling talk studies, so you can file for IND. Some of that, some of that is not set up uh, within the academic arena to actually to to support the investigator. So, I, I'll just be waxing poetically about some of the things that I think would be really useful. Um, so, early phase drug development activity, discovery, early stage research, and late stage research, target selection, validation. We do really well. Proof of activity. I think UCSF and the researchers here does they do pretty well. Lead molecule optimization. We're not set up. There are pockets of people within UCSF that probably can do that well, but we're not set up as an institution or a system to actually address that. Evaluation of unmet need. We have lots of clinical experts that can do that. It's just that those connections with the researchers haven't happened. So how do we do that better? And then defining target candidate profile. So understanding what the medical uh, unmet medical need is, understanding what the standard of care is, uh, will help you to decide what kind of a molecule you need when you're still in the discovery stage so you can actually address that early on. Um, we're not set up to do that systematically, but we want to do that better because I think you know that, that really actually will enrich the potential uh, pull of, of research that can actually go beyond the lab. Um, late stage, selecting lead molecule indication selection, all of that needs to happen, and then defining target product profile. If this were to turn into a drug, what kind of a drug does it need to look like? Understanding what the competitive landscape looks like, what's the market for this, and what's the uh, reimbursement hurdle, what's the regulatory path for this, this sort of indication, all of that stuff, all of that needs to be discussed up front. That doesn't, um, we're not, again, we're not systematized to do that up front. Um, I think it's, we need to figure out a way to do that a little bit better. Early development, clinical manufacturing, um, IND enabling toxicology studies, regulatory filing strategy, and overall clinical development strategy. So all of that stuff, I think, rarely um, happens within the confines of UCSF. But can we do better in finding the right partners at the right time to partner on some of these aspects? And I think those, um, those are all things that would be really important for us to think about. 
I, I don't think we should necessarily be in the business of recapitulating what the drug companies do, but I think all many of the um, many of the necessary components to do all of the stuff we do have within our confines. Some of them we don't, but many of them we do. We just need to find ways to make sure that the connections are happening at the appropriate time. And and because most researchers are are really so focused on the research at hand and some uh, that those connections aren't always happening and so how can we how can we play a part in connecting people better so that we utilize the resources that are within our within our reach and then if those resources and those expertise doesn't don't exist within UCSF we're in an incredibly rich environment in the bay area to reach out and get those resources elsewhere and who do we are we able to, are we keeping a database of what's out there and who the good partners are and how to structure the terms so that we get a we are able to uh, create a collaboration that's that's mutually beneficial. So all of those things I think are places where CTSI can facilitate. Um, I don't think I need to. Do that one. So, so bridging uh, the valley of death, and I think you know, uh, within the within the academic world, translational world, especially the early translational research, has often been referred to as the valley of death, and I think for um, uh, for good reason, because I think all of the things that I, all of the different components that I talked about earlier with respect to being able to take a molecule um, and what it takes to take that molecule beyond the labs um, aren't there for, for, uh, uh, for easy use. And so, um, and so people spend a lot of time and energy trying to overcome those hurdles rather than, and that takes, obviously takes away from the science that should be happening. Um, CTSI and UCSF, as well as outside of UCSF, NIH, and other places, and uh, the pharma industry around us are starting to address this in, in slightly different ways, and I think we're starting to, starting to fill in the gaps. I, I, I think the gap is, there's still some gaps there, but we're starting to fill in the gaps and, 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 and trying to figure out what works, what, and we're gonna be doing a lot of sort of experimenting exploring and experimenting to figure out which of these things meet the gaps, gaps best and, and what types of gaps are met best by which of these uh, thing, uh, programs that are being put into place. But again, NIH funding with respect to uh, formation of CTSA is, is, uh, is uh, meant to address some of the, some of the uh, infrastructural process component of this. I don't know if many of you know, but Pfizer and UCSF have uh, right now a couple of um, couple of uh, uh, collaborations ongoing. One through QB3 and one through the Chancellor's Office. They're both focused. They're they're um, angled slightly differently, but both are really to um, really really to focus on identifying programs that have potential either as a diagnostic or Therapeutic moving forward and trying to trying to provide some of the support, some of the infrastructural supporting and capability support that may not exist in UCSF that that pharma does really well, like molecule optimization and clinical manufacturing, that kind of stuff. Providing that um, and marrying uh, UCSF researcher with a researcher on that and to to facilitate moving programs forward. Team on Catalyst program, I'll talk about a little bit more in detail in just a bit. Um, and QB3 has done tremendous work in, in filling some of the gap here by providing the startup garage and, and, and a lot of the other um, expertise and consultation that they've put in place to enable uh, uh, budding entrepreneurs. And our seed funding, we talked about, many talked about a little bit. Um, you know, this looks like we've met the gap, but we haven't. I mean, I think there's still clearly lots of places where, where gap exists that we're, we're still trying to get a better handle on. 
and, and more importantly, get a better, better handle on how to address those gaps. So that, um, you know, I, 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 I think is, is uh, the big challenge ahead. So short-term work plan for me is I'm uh, still in the gathering information phase. Again, I've been here for five weeks. So I um, have lots of meetings with lots of people around the campus who are actually directly doing translational investigations or people who, are, who would touch translational research in some shape or form to get a better understanding of what the pain points are, what's working well, what's not working well, what would really help to propel their, their research that, uh, that CTS, CTSI might be able to help with. Um, and then other institutions, I'm looking around at other institutions that might do some aspect of translational research better than we do and trying to figure out which of those things might fit it fit in at UCSF. And then I'm continuing at the moment to, um, to build external networks, both in the VC industry, startup, indus uh, startup companies, um, external uh, other academic collaborators. And then, you know, my, my, my goal is over the next few months to define key priorities for what CTSI is going to focus on with respect to addressing the T1 uh, translational needs for this uh, for this community. At the moment, how I and CTSI can help you, we can help to identify and help facilitate potential collaborations both within UCSF and, uh, and external to UCSF. And um, you know, I'm building up that uh, the the database of what folks are doing. But but if I if there's something that I don't know, I certainly can. Uh, access the folks who might know to to get you the contacts that you need for to help you um, form collaborations if appropriate and then um, we're here to provide early consultation for projects and programs we have uh, experts within uh, that are part of CTSI but we also have lots of um, industry experts that we have access to that we can connect you with as well if it's if it's appropriate for the program that you're working on um, and then like many mentioned there are potential funds both through way of t1 catalyst program and sos and and and, and uh, sos and seed funding that we can uh, direct you to if, if it's appropriate and then how you can help me um, if you uh, have uh, if you have experience in, in, in doing this at UCSF and have, um, you know, have information you, you'd be willing to share with respect to what's worked well, uh, what could work better, I'd love to hear it because I consider this room to be a very rich pool of re uh, information. If you're aware of successful T1 programs at other CTSAs and other institutions, please let me know. If you have a project or program or issue that CTSA may be able to help with, please call, please con contact us, and um, and contact and please contact us if there are external col collaborators that you think we ought to know about uh, as part of our um, resource pool. Other inputs and perspectives and constructive feedback, all welcome. I, again, I'm information gathering mode at the moment. What will success look like? when um, a translational research investigator experiences a hurdle at UCSF. They see CTSI as a go-to source or partner to help in finding a solution. Um, we're hoping to generate success stories uh, as time goes on. And then, and then how those will be measured um, or to be determined, that, but, but hope, hopefully we'll be able to share that sometime soon. I think month one observations, UCSF has tremendous core strength and you all know that already, brilliant, innovative, and talented people. And I was really actually, you know, going to a lot of these um, seminars and conferences. Just last week, I remember, the, I remember saying to myself, what a, what a really tremendous privilege to be here because surrounded by such talented people and they're, um, despite, the, despite the systematic challenges, so much amazing work is being done, and can you imagine if you were to remove some of the systematic barriers, the kind of work that would that would happen? So, um, great discovery scientists, deep expertise in many areas, 
And the other thing I've been really impressed with is despite the system, systematic challenges, people are figuring out ways to make things work. And so there are so many, uh, so many examples of where, yes, we couldn't do this, so we just got this and we went around it and people f figure out ways to make things work. And um, you know, the hope is that, that we're able to identify those areas in which we can actually institute changes that, so that not everyone has to spend the energy trying to go around the systemic, systematic barriers that are there. Key challenge, current academic models not primarily designed to encourage translational research, and this is you know, in many different, uh, many different layers, right, in terms of promotional uh, criteria, in terms of um, funding, what gets funded, all of that stuff. But, but you know, I think that's part of the work that CTSI is charged to do, which is changing sort of the culture of how translational research is valued and, 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 um, and uh, done within an academic institution. So, but again, I think the opportunities are huge. Um, better the desire to do better translational research across the industry as well as academic institutions, it's on the map. Potential for new and innovative co collaborations with the industry partners in this area is really amazing. Um, it's enabled by government funding agencies and philanthropy. I mean, I, I was able there. There's a uh, there's a lot of momentum in trying to get translational research to work better, uh, even from uh, philanthropic organizations as well. So I think that's also another uh, opportunity that we need to we need to explore. Being in the San Francisco Bay Area, Bay Area I think I, I, if we were to have this conversation in another place like Kansas City, I'm sure we would not draw the quality of quality of, uh, of people and the expertise that we have in this room. So that's, and then, and then UCSF just has great component parts. Like ev everything that gets done here gets done really well. It's just gonna be a matter of figuring out the right connectors. Um, and then with that, I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the T1 Translational Catalyst Program because I think that, that some of you may uh, be interested in hearing about it. As, uh, as many mentioned, it's a program that's been in place for about a year. Uh, uh, the program concept is that research, technology, and programs committed to seeking translation opportunities uh, that may have a potential to develop into a new diagnostic or therapeutic entity uh, or possibly support identification of a new novel diagnostic or therapeutic entity are eligible. And then experts from industry, academia, and venture capital with experience in creating therapies and diagnostic tests will help the researchers outline appropriate next steps. So it's a customized customize, um, help that's provided to those who apply. Uh, we seek to identify the best projects, either it's w whether it be diagnostic or therapeutic, uh, and bring in the missing pieces. We talked about the continuum of drug devel development or diagnostic development and the components that UCSF has and the components that are within the UCS system, system that may be more difficult to identify and access and the components that don't exist here that we have access to in the community. So we bring in those component parts that are not with the current investigator to try to get that investigator to be more fully uh, resourced to address all of the, uh, all of the critical issues. And then um, we help to leverage limited resources by identifying partnerships. Um, so T1 Catalyst purpose, we talked about uh, convening team of experts to have investigators convey the potential of early stage research to investors. The model on which this is based is a program that has existed in Gladstone Institute. Um, uh, led by Stephen Friedman, and huge kudos to him because he helped to start the program about a year ago. And it's a phased approach of uh, providing progressively increasing benefit to the applicant. We'll talk about what that means. So uh, the application comes in. Uh, we have two cycles a year, uh, initial review, uh, assessing attractiveness and ease of implementation, and also IP poten potential for IP. And then the, the, the investigator or the applicant will get a written review of what is good, what's, what's lacking, what needs a little more work. And, um, and these programs will then go, go on to get a panel discussion. So panels are usually put together with 
uh, with the project in mind. So the proposal that was, pro every proposal gets a different customized panel and they'll get a very specific feedback. For instance, you need to talk with an IP attorney to figure out what that is, or you need to speak with a regulatory expert to figure out what the regulatory pathway for this sort of diagnostic is. And so they get, a, they get very specific feedback and some hand-holding as well. And then phase three is the consultation award. So you get a, you get a, um, a, a sum of money to use cons consultants to help round out the, the pieces that might not be as complete. For instance, um, uh, we just provided a program with a regulatory, uh, with a $10,000 award to get regulatory consultation to make sure that the, the regulatory uh, pathway is considered and, and, and all the risks uh, related to the regulatory uh, pathway and mitigation, mi mitigation plans have been put in place. And then um, for appropriate programs, we actually uh, provide um, development award, which right now is set at $100,000. Um, we've had, again, two cycles. We Two cycles, we're finishing up our third cycle, and then now, uh, come September, we will have our next cycle. So September 28th is the deadline for the next cycle, for those of you who might be interested. Um, it's... This slide is just to just to, gen, uh, to demonstrate the the broad spectrum of research programs that have come our way. So, you know, it's not strictly based on um, based on therapeutics. You can see that schistosomiasis was a diagnostic, as was Verachip, and RunSafe was uh, uh, a diagnostic of different sort. It was trying to figure out, you know, can we do a two D analysis of Gate analysis, 2D gate, 2D gate analysis that help people to um, to understand what their risk of injury from running is instead of the the standard 3D, which is more costly and and sometimes uh, difficult to difficult to get. So we consider a fairly wide variety of programs through T1 Catalyst program. So if you have ideas. Uh, or programs that you think are sort of at that, that critical juncture that you think T1 Catalyst program could be helpful uh, for, please do let us know, contact us. Even if it's before um, the cycle, we're very happy to engage in a discussion, so do let us know. Um, I won't go over the details of these programs. And... Um, Can you go back one? Yes. This one? Yes. Yes. So you'll also notice, Gail, and I've already noticed, um, and also, you know, QB3 also, there are some overlaps in some of the programs that come through the, the Buy Entrepreneur uh, Idea to IPO program with our program. Not a problem. I think um, our program, I think where it differs is we sort of do a real time, we run alongside you to try to Try to, but idea idea to IPO is a great program and sort of getting you to th refine your thinking. But we're we what this what our program does that's just a little bit different is we're running alongside you. Okay, so you're here. Let's figure out what's what we need to do at this point and provide you the consultation on the spot, um, which is different than just uh, one time judging and 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 so. Some of the programs that have come through the Idea to IPO program come over to us, which is what we want to see. We know that then we're addressing the different places where, where um, you know, where where uh, the the early translation pro programs could fall through the cracks. Sorry, it seems to be stuck. There you go. Um, so. Now working on enhancing understanding of the program across the campus. A lot of people on the campus, turns out, they don't really know what T1 Catalyst program is. We want to make sure that that potential uh, pe potential investigators who might benefit from this program know about it. So we're going to be doing more work to to advertise this program, and. Um, 
we're always refining the list of consultants to, to make sure that we have the best people on board. So those of you who might have some folks that you've worked with in the past, or some of you who want to volunteer to consider being a consultant for some of our programs, please do contact me and let me know. Um, and then, you know, right now we're fully funded through the NIH grants, but it's, at some point we will actually, we're start, starting to actively uh, explore mechanisms by we can be more self-sustaining. And then solicitation from me to you would be to spread the word about the T1 Catalyst program and CTSI. If you have a program which could potentially benefit from aspects of T1 Catalyst program, please apply or please call if it's, you know, if you need it today instead of waiting until September. Next cycle is September 2011 and the uh, website is there. Uh, if you just you know, if you just search on the UCSF website for, website for CTSI or T1 Catalyst, it'll, it'll lead you right there. That's all I have to say, and I'm happy to take questions and comments either now or later. My contact information is there. I like, look forward to working with many of you in the future. Either way. Here too, yeah. Yeah, yeah. All right. We're stand. Well, I have a, a first question, and, and I apologize. I know that you've been on the job for only five weeks, but yes. I wanted to ask if you have a first sense of what the major problems, that is the, the major friction points or the major dilemmas that uh, you see as uh, problems that your program is intended to address between the bridging the gap from academia to commercialization. What are yeah. the major issues that you've identified so far? I think there, there, um, I think there are, you know, there, there's, as many mentioned, there's a huge spectrum of research that falls under translational or, or even early translational research. And depending on which segment of those investigators you speak with, the pain points are very different. So the needs are quite, and even within the same segment, if you talk to someone who's doing genetics work, the kind of stuff that, that, that they would really find useful is very different from people who are doing kinase signaling work. So I, so I think, you know, really the, the, the uh, the approach has been to, well, what are the common themes? The common, I haven't interviewed enough people to have one common theme just yet. I think one of the things that was, um, that was highlighted was, yes, there's great research going on, but there isn't someone who's, there, there aren't enough people who have the eye to look for that program with the potential to move forward. And I think that is, True and not so true. There, there are people who do that on campus. In fact, there are people who, who's a, who, a good portion of their job is to go around and try to figure out what's going on that, that, that might be able to, you know, that has potential to move forward. I think there just are not enough people doing it, so it's not yet scaled. It's not yet scalable. So I think some of that, and I, I think really um, there are, um, there have to date also been um, a real real concern that there's not enough forums for that interaction for the late uh, late phase researcher with to, to interact with the early phase researcher so the things that could be bridged there's no place to have those discussions I think there are examples where that does work like cancer club I think you know the cancer club is a club that, that brings the, the clinicians together with basic science researchers um, in a forum to talk about uh, basic science research and how that might relate to clinical disease. But, you know, I think th those connections aren't happening as frequently as, as uh, one might like. So I think, you know, I can list, I can continue to list a number of things that have been brought up, but I, I have to say, at the moment, I haven't come up with the top three top three gaps yet. All right, thank you. Well, so, so one of the things that we could, so there are issues in um, 
that are big but are actually dealable with. That's almost, uh, there, there's a bunch of them we've seen at T1 Catalyst, right? And so that, where we're collating the kinds of things that are coming up and the, the things that I've seen um, uh, include IP things, some of which are really obvious, but you don't know what you don't know. So that to me, those are like, that's low hanging fruit. Um, so there's, there's IP stuff, there's clinical relevance. That's come up. So people know a bunch, even when they're working with people in the clinical domain, it seems like they've got all their I's dotted and T's crossed and you put the right people in the room and, and the question comes up, are these people even aware of standard of care? So it's really basic. Again, low hanging fruit. This is all about just matching the right person to, to someone else. And asking the right questions, right? That's right. And then we do, I mean, we work with, um, Eric Liam is here, I think, hiding in the back background, but um, with various campus offices that really provide sophisticated help with negotiations. That's been an issue that's come up. So there's somebody who's working with a company and they just have never done this before and they don't have any guidance. And one look by the right people and you know you don't want to write that deal and you want to write it some other way. Um, which I think in the long run is good actually for everyone um, concerned. So just to give you some of the, I'm, I'm a basic scientist, so this is my basic scientist's view on the things I've learned by, by watching the T1 Catalyst process. I don't think our charge is to turn, you know, researchers into entrepreneurs necessarily. I think we create the framework so that good science could turn into a business if it's appropriate without having to turn the good scientist into a bad entrepreneur. So I think those, <laughs> that's, you know, I think that's, so, so as, right, so, so trying to identify what the scaffolding is um, that's required to turn good science into good into a therapeutic is our charge not what does it take to turn a scientist into an entrepreneur i can see the next class is going to be from bad what did you say bad, good scientist to bad entrepreneur <laughs> did you finish your question okay my question is even if all these big factors are all lined up you have the right team the right market the right technology um, by the time you get to phase three, 90% of the stuff is gone. So even if everything looks right, you still have that problem. How do you deal with that? How do you make it a stronger suit all the way along from the beginning to the end? Right. I think that's a great question. Um, you know, if you look at molecules that are in the late stage research phase in the typical pharma, the probability of technical success of making it to uh, making it past phase three to approval is far less than 10%, right? And, um, and that's okay because those are small investments back then, but you really don't want to fail in phase three. So you want to do everything you can to minimize failure in phase three, phase three. but you can't minimize that risk until, un unless you're really addressing the issue from multiple perspective early on, for instance, um, like I said, you know, the, the multiple perspectives that's required early on includes clinical perspective. What's the med need? What's the standard of care? What sort of a, you know, so, so what if you have a good drug in, rheum in, in rheumatoid arthritis? The standard of care is once a week, now going to once monthly injectable. If you end up developing an IV drug, uh, five years down the line, it doesn't matter. No one's going to use it. So addressing those very, very simple components early on, do you know what the reimbursement hurdles are going to be there? It's not going to be good enough to just show that it works. You're going to need to show that it works better than what's out there right now. So taking care of that. Um, do you know what the regulatory hurdles are? 
uh, do you need to, if you have these kinds of safety events in this indication, is that ever going to be acceptable? Knowing that and making sure that you, you determine what the, what the move forward versus kill criteria are at the different stages early on to make sure that you're not moving programs forward just because simply you're, you're emotionally invested at that point, making good decision criteria early on, uh, bringing in all the different components, um, regulatory, commercial, clinical, uh, all of that early on I think is really critical to increasing that probability of technical success down the line. I just, I don't want to disagree with your, your quote, because it is a good quote. We don't want to turn good scientists into bad entrepreneurs, but imagine if um, computer scientists had said that 30 years ago. Uh, most of what's really leading this new economy is the experts being the business owners, not saying that, well, we did our part in the lab, let's just give it to this other guy to take it completely agree. I think I'm not saying all scientists would ma make bad entrepreneurs. I think there's some scientists who would gladly take on the role of being an ent entrepreneur and do it great, do it really well. Um, you know, like Steve Jobs, <laughs> like Art Levinson, there are a lot of people who do that really well. But, you know, our our goal isn't to take every scientist who might have a, have a discovery that could become a uh, therapeutic kicking and screaming to, to forming a company if we need to help that program to move along and that scientist wants to continue to do science, we are creating a framework that allows that process to happen, whether or not the scientist wants to lead the effort from that perspective. So I just wanted to add to that because I it made me think when you talked about you know good scientist to bad entrepreneur uh, and I knew you didn't mean just that the good scientists could no, would only become bad entrepreneurs and it's a good good pushback as well but what I what that made me think about is this so I have to say as a PhD scientist what I did confound was the the notion that if I wanted to push my stuff out of the lab it was sort of confounded with the thought that I was the one to do everything. And I think it's useful to actually split that. So in other words, are you more interested to make sure that your idea sees the light of day in terms of getting out there into the market? Or do you think you have an entrepreneurial spirit and you want to nurture that and or both? So I, I think it's actually useful to, to pull those apart. And I can just say that one of the things I've learned from a management perspective actually has been to dissociate my direct involvement with my sort of high level engagement with the outcome and the process. And so I just say that that I think is actually a useful distinction um, for folks to make for themselves. Uh, sorry about that, and not since I have a ma mic, so. Uh, I'm actually been involved with, uh, from idea to IPO for the last three years as a mentor. And my background is totally in the different areas in technology, but I've been involved with starting three companies. Uh, the interesting things about idea to IPOs, maybe as a plugging for them, uh, the fact that exactly what you brought, uh, the, the issue that you brought up, in our teams we find out there's lots of doctors and postdocs that they're not sure about they want to become an entrepreneur or they want to be starting a company. So one of the things I actually during this course, during the whole course of the idea to IPO, what they learn is about their positions in life what it's going to take to actually start an idea, a company from the idea point of view, to the point that it actually you learn from selections by elimination. Maybe all these kind of molecules you're talking about, maybe we only need only on one, and maybe even that one is not going to be useful because of the standard of care or whatever that uh, uh, the challenge is going to be. So I could see that actually one of the value add from idea to IPO type of concept, and not only necessarily only that, but that idea, that the fact that it really brings in the different dimensions of uh, people in the education or market uh, segment in particular, that they find their niche, they find out that maybe they're really good in research, they've never been, they don't, now they're seeing the process, 
what it's going to take to get one idea from the idea point of view to the point that you have to present it to the a community of the VCs, they find themselves that maybe they're really good in their researchers, mm -hmm. and vice versa. Some of the folks that we find out that are really good researchers, that this, we discover that actually these persons could become a, a potential good a person that could actually run the company. And they also learn that not necessarily starting the company doesn't mean you're the boss. And in fact, that the art of making deals is much greater, and they learn that in about halfway through the course that the whole part of it, the, the clinical stuff and the research is fantastic, but when it comes to where the money is and how you present it, it's a totally different ball game. And I think that's the growth that I see for the last three years helping with these uh, communities. Thank you. Thank you. As kind of a compliment to what you're doing, I could see the compliment of other courses that could help you as a deal flow, basically. Um, I was just wondering what um, programs or mechanisms are in place to identify unmet clinical needs that probably aren't being addressed by even the basic science labs themselves, um, and what ideas you might have to address those needs. Um, just because it's one thing to translate basic science that's in a lab, but if that basic science is so far away from anything that's right. even a clinical reality, then right. I mean, you, you could probably go to the clinic to see very simple right, problems right. that don't even require a wet lab. And I'm no, just No, I completely agree. I think, you know, there's some things, there's some, um, uh, like I talked, like I mentioned earlier, are there forums where clinicians and basic scientists can come together? Because how do you, you know, some people, how do you do research that's relevant in some way? You know, it's so clinically relevant or medically relevant. You need to put, you need to bring these people that that reside in different ends of the spectrum together to provide perspective, right? So I think um, there are uh, there are forums, there are venues that are being created to help that interaction to occur. I think for the trainees, um, there's there there's a course called the Anti Medical School that addresses that to a certain extent. Um, there is a program that's been started called Masters in Translational Medicine that help people to think about um, think about translational translational research more broadly up front. Um, so there, there, you know, there are pockets of activity happening and programs that are being produced to address that. But I think it really is at the level of the research and the research program where each of these things have to be refined, right? These discussions, refined discussions and nuanced discussions need to happen because it really, it's not one size fits all. In fact, it's quite not quite different than that. So you have to, um, one, recognize that those discussions need to happen and then, uh, and then, and then uh, leverage your resources to make sure that the right people sit around the table to help that discussion very very early on but i i completely agree with you that those that you know starting from um identifying what the unmet need is that you're trying to address by the work that you're doing is a very very important thing to 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 do up front yeah i just make a comment that i started at ucsf in 1973 in the cardiovascular research institute and that institute and the Cancer Research Institute and some others were formed primarily as uh, vehicles for funding and program project and score grants in which there were components of clinical research uh, based in the clinics at UCSF, basic laboratory science, and lots and lots of meetings. There were Saturday morning meetings, mm -hmm. there were all day mo Monday meetings, laboratory meetings, and so on. And so this concept of having the cross-fertilization between clinical relevance and laboratory is not new here. Uh, it's, it's actually very old. I think that what uh, we're talking about is a morphing of that type of interaction away from primarily being a grant funding vehicle and into a more uh, business-oriented uh, practical application. The only thing I'll add is, again, playing devil's advocate and putting myself in my basic science shoes. So one is to understand and represent and talk about the unmet needs. So And, and not just from a pharma or a 
in, in this case, an industry perspective, because there you really want to talk about disease, disease burden, whether it's relevant to a pharma business model or not. So there's that. And I think conveying that may have some benefits. But on the other hand, I mean, I really, I don't think it's straightforward to think about the culture of a basic scientist and, and how they might interact with that information. Um, it's not as if, you know, for example, for myself, I wasn't interested in disease. I was interested in disease, but what powered me to just to go into do a PhD? It's actually, I think, quite different from what powers people to go into or urges them to go into getting a, a clinical degree. I went in, it's, it's all curiosity based. And there's nothing wrong with that. You get a lot of great stuff. But how do I convert? How do you take someone who's, who's, who's charged by ideas, um, you know, that are abstract? and connect them to this reality, you know, this unmet need area. So I think it can be done. I think it's it'll be more than just representing sort of the uh, the spectrum of, of unmet needs. I think that's necessary. And then after that, we've got to start getting really creative um, and basically catching people wherever they might be able to drop off. And I can think of points in my career where were the environment to be different, one could take a different path, but it's not a direct line for sure. Well, a very simple way to deal with that is to recreate a, a physical environment, have people meetings mm -hmm. here in which you have clinicians talk about the, clin the unmet need that they're seeing in the clinic and have basic scientists do that. So all it takes is people having conversations. Mm -hmm. that, yes, no, I think that's not an insignificant component and, um, you know, I think uh, I won't say Genentech does everything well, but what one of the things that that has been highlighted as part of the secret sauce of uh, the success of Genentech has been the co-location. So, uh, so people who do research, people who do clinical work, people who do commercial work, all live in South San Francisco, and we run into each other all the time, and we can have those conversations, real-time conversations, to talk about um, talk about the projects, programs, the overall strategy. Um, and apparently Roche has taken that to heart because Roche, as you know, is a global company. They're, they're, uh, they have many locations, but what they've chosen to do most recently is to reorganize, to co-locate all of the therapeutic areas into various different locations. So, uh, so oncology, inflammation, and some other groups are gonna be in South San Francisco, and then neurology and, and um, psychiatry and some other groups are going to be located in Basel. So, you know, there's, I think there's something to that. Um, but I don't, I don't think it's everything, but I do think it's, it's an important component. 